I'd like to mirror the sentiment that Tim just raised of thanking all of you for giving us part of your Friday night and hopefully we'll make it worthwhile for you. Swamiji and I had a short meeting and talk for three minutes, <laughs> not more, prior to uh, this and we're meeting for the first time tonight. We agreed that perhaps I should start the ball rolling and I'll do so, Swamiji, with an idea that I'd love for you to comment on. In my 26 years of living in uh, India with my master and my master's master, we learned a lot about the Veda, V-E-D-A, Veda, in Sanskrit, the ancient language of India, of the Indian civilization. Veda means truth or knowledge, either way. And Veda is, in this day and age, conceived of as a body of information, which perhaps, if translated, you might be able to decipher. I come, as does Swamiji, from an ancient tradition known as Shankaracharya. And that Shankaracharya tradition uh, comes down from Adi Shankara, a master who lived about 2,500 years ago. One of the understandings that occurs in Vedic knowledge, at least in the training which I had, and I would love for Swamiji to comment, is that Veda is not simply a body of translatable into English or other languages information. It is a sound base. There is a sentence which comes from the Veda that describes it. It says, Nama Rupa Sahitam Bhavati Eva. Nama Rupa Sahitam Bhavati Eva. This means, Nama is where we get our English word name. Nama Rupa. Rupa means form. Name and form. Sahitam, infinitely correlated, together. They are together. Bhavati is the verb for to be. Eva, indeed. So, name or and form, sound and form have an infinite correlation. So then we look at the Veda and Rig Veda, the first part of the first words of Rig Veda, Agnimile Purohitam Yagyasya Devam Itvijam Hutram. First sound, ag, there's a stop in the word agni. Agni, if translated, means the word fire. But ag is the whole of creation as the mouth opens. And then the stop, ag, the beginning and the ending of the whole of creation is in that sound. It's one sound. And so then to get the most from the Veda, one has to learn how to get into the simplest form of awareness. That simplest form of awareness is called para. Para means that which is transcendent, that which lies beyond the waking, dreaming, and sleeping state. From that state, if you hear the Veda, then the Veda transmits and awakens knowledge inside you, not on the basis of word meaning. That knowledge of the mechanics of creation and how everything works together is embedded in those sounds. And so then the translation then becomes something which is relative to that, superfluous. I'll stop there. And I would just love to hear Swami G's comments on anything that I've just said. Thank you very much. Since tonight is all about sound, it's good to hear the sound of the original Vedic Sanskrit. So I'll start with a Vedic chant and then we'll go on from there. Om. 
असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 दैट मीन्स ओम लीड अस फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल lead us from darkness unto light lead us from death to immortality om peace 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 it's one of the most beautiful prayers that i've ever come across note how impersonal it is there's no connection to any particular religion or cult or a personality it's a impersonal approach as tom just said the vast body of knowledge vedas divided into the four sacred books of the hindus but in a more impersonal sense it's all of spiritual knowledge veda means knowledge now that ha- vast body of knowledge interestingly uh, can be put across very simply it can be put very simply um, interpreted in different ways in different traditions in one sense all of indian culture has flowed from the vedas certainly hinduism has the orthodox schools of hinduism but even if you consider the heterodox schools like the different schools of buddhism jainism even they are modeled on the vedas in even in rejecting veda as a source of spiritual knowledge you still you accept the veda as your point of departure so in that sense just about all of indian culture somehow flows from the vedas and this vast body you will be glad to know can actually be succinctly summarized in in one sentence uh, depends on the interpretation you give the interpretation which we share we come from a common tradition the advaita vedanta of shankaracharya so according to this particular tradition if you want to summarize the entire teaching of all the, the entire vedas it would be this sentence tat tvam asi that thou art now this is very interesting in fact if you look at not just the vedas not just hinduism if you go to the great religious traditions of humanity you find what aldous huxley called the perennial philosophy at the core of which is this intuition which mystics of all religions have got through the ages that somehow we are one with divinity at our core that's the central teaching of the vedas so if you this is the take away you want from this evening that thou art uh, aham brahmasmi i am brahman that's the essence of the vedas if you want to simplify it even further and here is where it connects with what we are doing today if you want to simplify it even further it's just one sound om om it's a sound which is sacred to all the various branches of hinduism to all of buddhism to jainism in fact sikhism all the uh, indic traditions in fact in sikhism the name for the ultimate is ik omkar om is the name of the ultimate in the patanjali yoga sutras we find tasya vachaka pranava the name for the absolute is om so if you have a name for god a common name for god that would be om now what i want to do here is relating it with what tom just said there is a way of understanding om um intellectually but then using the sound itself for enlightenment it goes something like this tom hinted at it in the mandukya upanishad what i'm going to say is based on the mandukya upanishad part of the uh, atharva veda there it's put it very simply we experience life in three phases one is this where you are awake you are aware of yourself as the subject and here is the world this the, the beautiful hall and the museum and new york and and the whole world as your object what we call our waking state so this is one phase of life but the way that goes deeper there is another phase of life when you fall asleep tonight and dream 
There also there is a world in dream. You experience people and places and things and things happen, good and bad, and you are there in your own dream. You have a body, a dream body. You do not recognize a dream as a dream. Only when we wake up, we see a dream as a dream. But when it's going on, you have a subject-object experience in the dream. You are dreaming and you see things in the dream. And then we slip into deep sleep, where there is neither subject nor object. A vast darkness and restfulness, deep sleep. But that is also experienced. That's the interesting thing. So we have these three phases of experience. Waking, you are the waker. This is your waking world. Dreaming, you are in your dreams and you have a dream world. And deep sleep, where you do not have cognizance of a separate subject experiencing an object. They say the subject and object are fused into a non-dual unity. Deep sleep. And this cycles. This is the story of our life, basically. Now, what does Om have to do with it? Very briefly, this. The entire world of waking, the name and form which Tom just mentioned, all of that, and you, the waker, associate it with the first part of Om. Om, by the way, is made of three distinct sounds. A, U, M. But don't pronounce it as Aum. Because the rules of Sanskrit grammar say when you add a uh and u together, it becomes o. So the correct pronunciation is om. Now, associate your waking world, this world, you the waker and your waking life, with the sound a. Uh. He just said from the a uh has come the entire universe. This is what it means. Just make a mental association. A uh is this world. As you slide into U, A, O, M, as you slide into that, imagine this world disappears, you're in bed sleeping, you forget that you're in bed sleeping and you have a dream world, dream, the dream subject is there, the dream subject and his or her dream world is U, the second part. And as you close with the M, mm, the last part of Om, that's the deep sleep where everything coalesces into one vast darkness and restfulness, a non-dual, no subject, no object. And then that mmm trails off into silence. What om means on a face value, waking, dreaming and deep sleep and in its implication, in its implication, this is essential, that transcendent awareness para which Tom talked, talks about, when you trail off into the mmm and it goes into silence, that indicates the transcendent awareness. The silence after Om. Before the next Om starts. Now, this is the practice of the Om. Just one more point and I'm done. <laughs> this, this silence at the end of Om, this silence is not the opposite of sound. It, it rather is the matrix, the foundation from which all sound emerges and merges back into silence. So this silence is present even when you are chanting Om. This transcendent awareness is present even now. That's what lights up our world. Our waking world, our dream world, and even the darkness of deep sleep. So underneath the chanting of Om, and at the end of Om, this silence continues. We'll talk more about this silence later on. But basically, this is the meaning of Om. You chant a long Om. You can do that without any meaning associated. That's perfect also. But you can do it with this meaning associated. A uh, is my whole waking life. U, as I slide into the U part of it, it's my dreams. And M part of it, it's the deep sleep. I am the transcendent consciousness who experiences these three, ever revolving in my awareness. That gives you a detachment from your waking, dreaming, deep sleep. And also immanence. You are the one in your waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, and yet you are apart from it. Enough to be going on with. <laughs> Would you like to comment it's on that? It's yeah. so beautiful. Um, I could listen all night, but yeah. I think I'd better say something yeah. <laughs> as well. And, uh, and gosh, you've given me so much. Um, I like to think of another analogy for waking, dreaming, and sleeping, and transcendence. 
Here we have the waking state. We have the dreaming state. We have the sleeping state. And there is a transition from one state to the next. As we transition from waking into sleeping, there is a moment where we're faintly awake, not quite awake fully, but not quite asleep either. As we move from sleeping to dreaming, there is a junction point. As we move from dreaming uh, back into sleeping or back into waking, there is a junction point. I see these things as three curtains that if you pull them apart at any time of night or day, because you can fall asleep or dream or whatever, any time night or day, if you pull the curtains apart, there's something behind it. In that junction point between consciousness states lies the transcendence. And the basis of meditation is to be able to induce that junction point. You would sit quietly using your technique and you would enter into the state which is not quite waking, not quite sleeping, not quite dreaming, where consciousness is the nature of the state. Consciousness standing alone, experiencing itself. So behind these three curtains of waking, dreaming, and sleeping, we have the one continuum of para. Para, transcendental meaning beyond the regular experience. Consciousness in its pure state, its pure self-referral. So then from the point of view of our tradition, if you can establish that state of awareness as a continuum, as Swamiji said, regular experience of it awakens that transcendent layer. And as that transcendent layer becomes a feature, a backdrop, that is to say, it starts to become more and more that which identifies what you are, not just who you are, because who often has to do with the body and birth circumstances and whatnot. What am I? I'm the witness. I am that which is experiencing waking, dreaming, and sleeping. This is the, should be the product of meditation. Once that consciousness state has established itself, and to whatever degree it has established itself, we can call it nitya. Nitya means eternal. Samadhi. Nitya samadhi. In Sanskrit, it means eternal transcendence. Transcendence which is there, no longer conditional upon meditation. Through meditation, it establishes itself as a permanent state. When the sounds of the Vedic sounds are heard from that level, then those Vedic sounds awaken the blueprint of creation. So knowledge is structured inside the consciousness state itself. Where do we find Veda? We don't really have to go to India to find Veda because Veda is a body of transcendent knowledge that is embedded inside the consciousness of everyone. So knowledge of all the laws of nature and relevant behaviors and your interaction with everything there is. Successful interaction means, you know, you suffer less. Then all of that knowledge is embedded inside the consciousness field that's inside your own awareness now. To awaken it, we have first to experience the para, the transcendent, through the techniques that Swamiji is a master of, and which I've also attempted to teach for <laughs> a few years. And through those experiences that come from that, and then from there, when we experience the Vedic sounds, that awakens knowledge of the whole world of relativity without having to use language to do it. So in the Vedic worldview, we would call this the subjective means of gaining knowledge. There are objective means of gaining knowledge, books, all of that. People, teachers, experience, moving around the world. The object world can inform you. But the Veda teaches that that consciousness, that 
consciousness that is deep inside you. Richo akshare parame vyoman yasmin deva adevishve nishedo. It's from the tenth mandala of Rigveda. Richo akshare. It says that the knowledge of the Veda itself, the richas, the knowledge that is contained in the Veda itself, is embedded in the akshara. It's embedded in the transcendent consciousness field. Yasmin deva adivishve nishedu. It says something like, by the way, all of the gods are inside there too. You want to know where are all the devas, all the gods, all of the laws of nature, all of the forces of creation? They're also embedded inside that consciousness field, which is inside you. And so then when we read in different scriptures, different ways of putting this. The rabbi from Nazareth said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Within you. Somehow people seem to miss that. You know, that the idea that heaven is a place up in the sky. But it's within you. First you seek that, God. First you seek that kingdom of heaven and all else will be added unto you. You see, we can see the reflections of this Vedic knowledge in Western interpretations of Middle Eastern religions. <laughs> I love referring to Judeo-Christianity as Middle Eastern. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's my little contribution for the moment, Swamiji. Well, it just uh, reminded me of something, talking about Western interpretations. <laughs> um, I'll quote a most unlikely person to quote in this gathering, Sam Harris, who is no friend of religion. <laughs> uh, he is one of the most trenchant critics of religion. But he has got this book, Waking Up, Waking Up, in which he says, um, not a bit grudgingly, that there is this idea in two of the traditions I found in Advaita Vedanta and Dzogchen Buddhism, on which most of the, a good deal of the artwork that you see in the Rubin um, are based on Dzogchen Buddhism. There is this idea of pure consciousness underlying all our conscious experiences throughout the day, which you find in both of these traditions. And he says, you cannot deny this. There's a core of truth. So here is a person who's a neuroscientist by training, um, an extreme critic of religions, um, but he says this particular idea of the para, you, you actually cannot deny it. What good is it? And what is the point of all of this? The point is this, that if it is true that I am this pure consciousness, witness consciousness, transcendent consciousness, whatever you call it, if it is true that I am that, the question, what am I, becomes very important. If I think I am this little body and mind, which most of us think, then the world can seem a threatening place, a place of persecution, a place where I have, my days are limited. I am a tiny part of a, of a vast, uncaring universe. I mean, especially in the last 100 or 200 years, the poet speaks about the receding tide of faith. And they speak about the God-shaped hole in the psyche of humanity. <laughs> when you lose faith in religion and God, and you cannot believe anymore in traditional ways of teaching religion because we know far too much about the universe now. Uh, so, but that leaves us with a, what is called the God-shaped hole in the human psyche, which somebody very wittily quipped that the Buddhist replaced with a hole-shaped God. The, the, <laughs> the, the hole-shaped God, the shunya, the void. <laughs> yes, so if it is true that such a thing is there, and that we are that essentially, and it is accessible to us. After all, that's our real nature. It's very, very important. It is, it's of central importance to our lives to become aware of that, to realize what we are. Um, that's the purpose of the whole thing. There is a, I'll again uh, stop with this, a technique. There is a tradition, not the tradition which we follow, but you know about it, the Kashmiri Shaivism. Uh -huh. Yes, a beautiful tradition. Um, in one of their texts, Vigyana Bhairava, they have 112 different techniques of all arriving at this intuitive flash of realization. And those are very beautiful techniques. 
I'll share one with you right now, which is exactly what Tom was talking about, the middle between two states. They are saying the middle between any two cognitions, the para shines through the, through the cracks, if you might uh, put it that way. The technique goes like this. Ask yourself right now, close your eyes and ask yourself, am I aware? And the answer will come forth almost immediately. Yes, of course, you note the awareness within. You are aware, you are hearing, you are presumably. <laughs> you're, it's dark, I can't see. <laughs> so, uh, you hear, you see, you think, so you are aware. So you ask yourself, am I aware? And the answer comes almost immediately, yes, I am. And the Vijnana Bhairava says, focus on the in-between. Drop the question, drop the answer, settle down in the in-between. You begin to get the idea. <laughs> it's beautiful. You can open your eyes now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, that, that is not going anywhere. <laughs> the, yeah, that, that's... <laughs> it's, it's very interesting that Buddhism and Hinduism are set up as being just the opposite of each other. Here is Hinduism talking about a permanent pure consciousness as the self, and Buddhism talking about the non-self, atma and anatma. Seems to be the polar opposite. But when you come to Advaita Vedanta and Dzogchen Buddhism, the, the Madhyamaka Buddhism of Nagarjuna, you begin to see that they speak the same language. One is talking about fullness, infinitude. The other one is talking about the void. But the void and the fullness, they use exactly the same language to describe the both, <laughs> both of them. I find it very helpful, Swamiji, to um, teach some of these ideas by using the analogy of ocean. Think of an ocean, one indivisible whole field. Now let's make the ocean conscious. One indivisible whole conscious field. And that ocean, if it is completely flat, it's super symmetric. But if the ocean begins to curve, if it breaks its symmetry and begins to curve into a wave, that individuation of the ocean, that wave, we look at that. If we look at a wave, it's very tempting to say the wave is connected to the ocean. But in fact, it's not connected. The wave is the ocean. Mm -hmm. It is the ocean. Connected means it's something separate, but connected. And when I see a wave in the ocean, I see no glue or screws or tape or anything. Mm -hmm. It's simply the ocean curving. Think of your individuality as a curve of the one indivisible whole consciousness field. That one indivisible whole conscious field, we have a name for that in the Sanskrit language, it's Brahman, Brahman. And Swamiji used one of the expressions of that enlightenment, which is Aham Brahmasmi. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Brahman totality. Brahman means totality. Mind you, I am not the totality. The totality is separate because of the. I am totality. Aham Brahmasmi. I am totality. There's no the, no article. Wave is ocean. Individual is cosmic. Individual is cosmic. The ultimate lesson of Veda. Individual is cosmic. Since that is a fundamental truth, if we can de-excite the wave, de-excite <laughs> the individuality, and Swamiji was just teaching us a technique from Kashmiri Shaivism to do that, de-excite the individuality, then as the wave collapses, ocean appears, but there's a place. The last flop of the wave, where the wave curvature is almost gone, but not quite. The ocean is very evident, the oceanic, but there's faint, faint curve. We have a name for that in Sanskrit too. Rittam 
bhara pragyan. That state of consciousness where individuality is still present and universality is also present. Neither is canceling out the other. Neither is it absolute pure transcendence, nor is it just dominating individuality. Both exist simultaneously. And it is that sweet spot where my individuality is experienced as an expression of my universality, there is the enlightenment. That's the enlightenment there. And so the elimination of individuality, pure transcendence, there's no individuality in pure transcendence. That is a temporary experience. That kind of samadhi where you have a moment of no thought, but consciousness only. Consciousness knows itself. The mind doesn't experience being there. The mind becomes being, and being knows itself. But what we want is for individuality and universality to coexist. And for that, we have to go many times to that experience. Many times, back and forth, back and forth to that sometimes all the way into transcendence, sometimes back here in the field of thought, but eventually the mind will settle in that ritam bhara pragyan. Ritam means the whole truth. Bhara, bhara pragyan, the consciousness state in which the whole truth is held. What is the whole truth? Individuality is cosmic. Cosmic and individuality do not cancel each other out. They can live in one state. And it's that one state that the whole of Vedic teaching enthusiastically encourages us to develop in this lifetime. Beautifully put. <laughs> I love the ocean uh, metaphor for the whole thing. <laughs> it reminds me of Ashtavakra, who's, uh, mm -hmm. one of the most radical non-dual teachers and a favorite book in our tradition. <laughs> I think the Swami loves it also. Yes, uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, Tom loves it also. Um, the ocean metaphor comes a number of times there. Um, three levels of what Tom just spoke about. Individuality merging into the cosmic. Three levels, each deeper than the preceding one. So let's just do this. Just listen to this, the original verse, and I'll translate for you, and you can follow along. The wave becoming the ocean. <laughs> Ashtavakra says, Mai ananta maham bodo vishwapota itastata brahmati swanta vatena namamastya sahishnuta. I am an infinite ocean of consciousness. Look, here he doesn't even say that I am a wave in an ocean. He says, I am the ocean of consciousness in which in which, he says, the entire universe, body, mind included, my body, mind, and the entire universe, is like a little boat. The whole of the universe is like a little boat floating in me, the ocean of consciousness. And the boat floats according to its own, uh, he says, antawata, uh, the, the inner wind. Uh, it means the wind of cause and effect. The universe functions according to cause and effect. But beyond that is the unmoving ocean of consciousness, which I am. And what's my attitude to the, to the little boat, to the universe? Namamastya Sahishnuta. I am not impatient. How, it's a beautiful way of looking at your own life. I am not impatient. <laughs> this is just the opening. Appetizer. <laughs> we go deeper. The second verse is... Mai man ananta maham bodo vishwa vichi swabhavata udetu vastamayatu name vriddhi navakshati. I am an infinite ocean of consciousness in which the entire universe, body, mind, and this little life included, is like a wave. So I am the ocean in which the person is a wave. You know, an interesting insight of Om is, if you repeat the Om enough times and you begin to see this, 
It is not the individual who gets freedom. It is not you, the person, who gets freedom. You get freedom from the person. The person doesn't go away, don't worry. You'll still, it'll still be there. You, <laughs> the body will be there, and the mind will be there, and the problems also will be there. But you have stepped back from the person into a vastness. I am this vastness of consciousness in which the individual and all other individuals and indeed this entire world, samsara, is a wave. Let the wave arise, let it subside. The ocean neither increases nor decreases thereby. Let there be birth, I do not gain anything thereby. Let there be death, I do not lose anything thereby. Success and failure, praise and insult, rich and poor, learned. A person I, I am just reminded of, a monk I knew many, many years ago. He was one of the most brilliant scholars of our order. And towards the end of his life, of course, old age problems. I used to go to him with questions. Once I went to him the question, just few, some weeks before he passed away. And this most brilliant of scholars, he thought and he thought and he thought. And he said, you know, I can't remember. It's all fading away now. Imagine, for a scholar, it's like a person who's lost everything in the latest Wall Street crash. So, like, a, <laughs> like, like you've lost all your, all your money, uh, all the stocks have crashed. It's disaster for a scholar to lose all of that. When the mind slows down and you're losing uh, memory, he says, I can't remember it anymore. And then with this, his characteristic twinkle in his eyes and his broad smile, he said to me, I still, I cannot forget that, he said to me, let it go, its work is done. All that scholarship, all the Vedas and the learning, let it go. It fades away. It doesn't matter. He's established in, the, in the what is beyond. So let it go. I'm not diminished thereby. I have reached a state where I'm neither increased by worldly success nor diminished by worldly failure. Second stage. We go even further, even deeper. And the third one. Mayananta Mahambodho Vishwam nama vikalpana ati shanto nirakara eta devaha I am this infinite ocean of consciousness. Where? What about the universe? Is it a boat? Look at the boat idea. The boat is even a little different from the ocean, right? It floats in the ocean. The wave is a part of the ocean. You see how it progresses. And now he says, like Tom just said, a flat ocean, no wave at all. What is the universe then? What is the body? What is life then? It's, an, it's just name and form, an appearance. Vikalpana. It's imagination. It's an appearance. It's a dream in this consciousness. Then what am I? Ati shanta nirakara. Ever formless, ever serene. Etad evahamastita. Thus do I abide from eternity to eternity. And they take this up to heights. Vivekananda used to say, where human lung can scarcely breathe. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, it does produce silence. In fact, they say, <laughs> the Vedas, from this mass of literature, it's condensed into one sentence, that thou art. Further condensed into one word, Om, one sound. Beyond that, if you push beyond that, silence. They say the silence is the highest teaching. Maunam Vyakhyanam. The, st the students come to the master. There's a beautiful description by Shankaracharya. <laughs> students come to the master, and the master teaches in silence, and the students sit with their doubts dispelled. But this actually used to happen with Ramana Maharshi, yeah. right? And we, yeah, we yes, find yes. the descriptions. The si Mm -hmm. You have this beautiful um, uh, exhibition upstairs. Look how the connections come. Uh, the, the Cartier Bresson photography exhibition on the sixth floor. No, fifth floor, I think. Yes, the sixth floor is Ohm. So there's only one thing beyond Bresson, that is Ohm. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the Bresson ex uh, uh, exhibition, he came to visit Ramana Maharshi on the day Ramana Maharshi passed away. But there are beautiful pictures of the sage uh, Ramana Maharshi, who used to live in the cave you know, all his life. And he would sit in silence. And you just look at the face of the sage. You can, you can Google it. Nowadays, it's very easy to find the pictures. If you want to go into meditation, 
even without OM, you just have to look at a face like that, a person who is permanently established in OM, somebody like that. He taught in silence. 